In November 2016, an ATS 72 stalled and lost 1600 feet before the crew regained control. In the next 10 months, it happened again two more times. Why did it happen? And what can we do to prevent it from happening again? Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl, I'm an ATA type rating instructor and airline captain. And this channel is all about aviation. This video is the second in a series of two videos about flight in icing conditions. In the first video, I explain how ice accretion affects aircraft in flight and procedures used by ATR. You will find a link below if you haven't seen it yet. In this video, I will discuss three very similar incidents that happened over a period of only 10 months. What those incidents have in common is that the aircraft entered severe icing, but the flight crew did not understand the seriousness of the situation and they did not respond to several warning signs. As a result, the aircraft stalled. Thankfully, nobody were injured. All three incidents could have been avoided if the flight crew had followed the procedure given by the aircraft manufacturer. The objective with this video is to learn and hopefully prevent similar incidents from happening again. Before we start to study those incidents, we must define a minimum operating speed for flighting icing conditions with the flaps retracted. This speed depends on the weight of the aircraft. At 18 tons, the speed is 150 knots. At 22 tons, the speed is 165 knots. In ATR with EFIS cockpit, the speed is called the red bug because it's marked with a red bug on the airspeed indicator. In ATR with glass cockpit, the speed is marked with an amber bug on the airspeed indicator. It's called the icing bug. When ice accretion is detected, the aircraft must maintain a speed at or above icing bug plus 10 knots. So, if your weight is 22 tons, you must maintain at least 165 knots plus 10 knots, which is 175 knots. This speed is mentioned in every checklist related to icing. However, after those incidents, ATR has amended the procedure for severe icing. When the speed is less than icing break plus 30 knots, you are restricted to maximum 15 degrees bank in turns. The first incident happened with an ATR-72-600 in Norway. The information I present here is extracted from the report issued by the Accident Investigation Board Norway, AIBN. There is a link to the report below. During flight planning, the crew noted that moderate icing was forecasted up to flight level 200 or 20,000 feet. For an unknown reason, the flight crew estimated that the icing will decrease above flight level 140. They plan to fly at flight level 190. The first officer will be PF, pilot flying. The weight of the airplane was 19.5 tons, defining the Isenberg to be at 156 knots. After departure, the aircraft climbed with the autopilot engaged with the IS mode set to 170 knots, which is standard climb speed for ATR-72. The anti-ice system were on, and when passing flight level 100, ice accumulation was detected and the de-icing systems were activated. As they climb higher, the icing become more intense. When passing flight level 1 to 7, the rate of climb was 765 feet per minute. But in the next 30 seconds, the rate of climb was reduced to half. When passing flight level 137, the APM, the Aircraft Performance Monitoring System, issued a degraded performance caution. At the same time, both pilots observed ice forming on the side windows. The first officer also observed water streaming over the window and told the commander that they had freezing rain. The power was increased to MCT, maximum continuous thrust, and IES mode was set to 165 knots. When reaching flight level 160, the APM issued an increased speed caution. The indicated airspeed mode was set back to 170 knots and the aircraft stopped climbing. 
The crew agreed to descend and turn west towards the sea, where they expected less ice. The autopilot was still engaged. After their commander had obtained clearance from ATC, a descent towards flight level 150 was initiated. During descent, the power was reduced to cruise power. After leveling off at flight level 150, the airspeed started to decrease. The crew observed more and more ice forming on the aircraft. The commander requested ATC for clearance to turn to a westerly direction, which was granted. The autopilot was set to turn left for the new heading. While in the turn, at an airspeed of 163 knots, the autopilot is connected. The bank towards left increased abruptly and the stick shaker activated. The first officer reacted by pushing the control wheel forward and to the right while applying right rudder. At the same time, the commander took hold of the control wheel and pulled back. The first officer was not aware of that. The aircraft rolled 68 degrees to the left, then 66 to the right, before it rolled back to left, reaching 36 degrees bank. The first officer responded to the uncontrolled banking with opposite rudder and aileron inputs. The angle of attack reached a maximum of 15.9 degrees and the stick pressure activated twice. Then the nose dropped to 11.9 degrees below the horizon and the speed increased to 190 knots. The aircraft lost 1600 feet before it leveled off and started to climb steeply. The speed decreased rapidly and the power was increased to MCT. The aircraft climbed for about 1000 feet while the speed dropped to 150 knots. While the aircraft was climbing, the APM issued an increased speed caution for 28 seconds. The crew requested and received clearance to descend. When the aircraft descended below flight level 127, the ice started to disappear. And the aircraft continued to the destination and landed safely. No injuries were reported. The second incident happened with an ATR-72-500 in the United Kingdom. The information I present here is extracted from the report from the Air Accidents Investigation Branch, AAIB. There's a link to the report below. When preparing for this flight, the crew noted that moderate icing was forecasted between flight level 100 and flight level 190. They planned to fly at flight level 170. The commander will be pilot flying. They departed with a weight of 22 tons, defining the Redberg to 165 knots. The aircraft climbed at 170 knots. During climb, the anti-icing systems and the de-icing systems were activated. When passing flight level 110, degraded performance and increased speed cautions eliminated. The indicated airspeed was increased to 175 knots as required by the icing procedure. The rate of climb reduced from 420 feet per minute to about 25 feet per minute and the increased speed caution extinguished. The commander knew that the procedure required an increase in speed to Redberg plus 10 knots, but he considered that as the aircraft was flying level, it was safe to set the indicated airspeed back to 165 knots. As he adjusted the speed, he commented, just see if we can get above. The autopilot remained engaged in indicated airspeed and heading modes. About one minute later, the increased speed caution eliminated again. At this point, the commander commented, we are picking up quite a bit of ice actually. Later adding that this was the first time he had encountered this deterioration in climb performance. At this point, the aircraft's rate of climb was about 200 feet per minute. The indicated airspeed was again increased to 175 knots. The aircraft started to descend and level off close to flight level 120. The indicated airspeed was then reduced to 165 knots, which initiated a further climb. The crew requested air traffic control to level off at level 130, so the aircraft could accelerate before resuming climb. Air traffic control approved this and instructed the crew to proceed direct to a given waypoint which required a changing heading. 
As the aircraft turned towards the waypoint, the aircraft rolled 32 degrees to the left, the autopilot disengaged, the aircraft rolled 38 degrees to the right, before it rolled left, reaching 73 degrees bank and 16 degrees nose down in pitch. The commander instructed the first officer to do the upset recovery items, including selecting flap 15. During the incident, the aircraft lost about 1,000 feet. During recovery, the pitch reached a maximum of 90 degrees nose up and indicated airspeed drop to 123 knots. However, the aircraft did not stall because the flaps were set to 15 degrees. While this happened, the first officer transmitted a mayday call. Once control had been regained and the situation assessed, the decision was made to return to the departure airport, where the aircraft landed without further incident. There were no injuries. The third incident happened with an ATR-72-500 in Spain. The information I present here is extracted from the report issued by the Civil Aviation Accident and Incident Investigation Commission, CIA IAC. There's a link to the report below. The forecast for the first part of the flight was light and moderate icing at flight level 140. They plan to fly at flight level 170 and the first officer will be pilot flying. The aircraft departed with a weight of 18 tons, defining the Redberg to 150 knots. However, before takeoff, the APM had been set to 16 tons. As a consequence, the threshold for APM cautions were delayed. During climb, pitch hold mode was used, resulting in a climb speed in excess of 170 knots. 10 minutes after departure, the anti-icing system were activated. And when passing flight level 130, ice accumulation was detected and the de-icing systems were activated. When passing flight level 160, the vertical speed had, in a period of 2 minutes, decreased from 1100 feet per minute to 500 feet per minute. And the APM now issued a degraded performance caution. When reaching flight level 162, the aircraft was not able to climb any further. Indicated airspeed mode was selected with 176 knots. The commander thought they would clear the clouds if they climb higher and requested ATC to continue climb to flight level 190, which was approved. The power was increased to MCT and vertical speed, VS mode, was selected with a vertical rate of 500 feet per minute. Later on, the vertical rate was increased to 1100 feet per minute. The power was then reduced to cruise and the speed decreased. Six seconds before reaching its maximum altitude, VS mode was adjusted to 800 feet per minute climb and shortly after to minus 200 feet per minute descent. The autopilot was still engaged. When reaching flight level 171, the aircraft stalled at the speed of 153 knots and the autopilot disengaged. The first officer initiated the stall recovery by pushing the control wheel forward. However, at the same time, the commander pulled back on the control wheel four times. The first officer handed the controls over to the commander. The aircraft banked 59 degrees to the left and 39 degrees to the right. The angle of attack reached a maximum of 19.6 degrees. Minimum recorded speed was 151 knots. The stick pressure activated three times. At the most, the pitch angle was 11 degrees nose down, but due to the commander's improper actions, it took 33 seconds to recover, and they lost almost 1,700 feet. Then, the aircraft climbed about 800 feet, losing speed, before it started to descend and accelerate again. While the commander was struggling to regain control over the airplane, the first officer called ATC and requested immediate descent. Five minutes after the stall, the crew informed ATC that they were clear of the clouds. And then the first officer took three pictures. This is the first officer's side window. There's some ice, but not alarming. And here is a picture of the windscreen wipers. There is some ice here too. And here is the captain's side window. The ice evidence probe is partially obscured by the ice on the window but it appears to be a big chunk of ice on the probe. Vibrations were felt in the aircraft. 
Therefore the commander decided to fly manually and not use the flaps. As he feared that the condition could be worse. About 40 minutes later the aircraft landed at the destination. There was no damage to the aircraft and no injuries. Well, what can we learn from this? The incidents tell me that despite the pilots had thousands of hours of experience, they were caught off guard. Even I'm sure that they must have experienced icing many times before. But as the British captain said, this was the first time he had encountered this deterioration in climb performance. Severe icing is a rare event and many pilots will never experience it in their career. What many seem to forget is that there are areas on the aircraft that are not protected from ice accumulation, such as the nose cone, tail fin, fairings and propeller spinner. It doesn't help that the de-icing boots are working perfectly because the ice will continue to build up on the unprotected areas, increasing the drag. The APM degraded performance caution is triggered when the aerodynamic drag has increased by 28%. And the increased speed caution is triggered when your speed is less than Isingberg plus 10. You can also have several other indications such as ice forming on the side windows, streaming water on the windows and loss of performance. And don't forget the ice evidence probe. The initial escape strategy for all three crews was to climb higher. The only problem was that they had no excessive energy. The speed was already low and the drag high. If there is something we can learn from this, it must be that trying to outclimb icing is not the best idea. The incident would have been avoided if the crews had respected the APM and applied the correct checklist and procedure right away. In one of the reports, the crew stated that they did not trust the APM because it had issued spurious alerts before. However, when you observe ice forming around you and you are losing performance, you must take action. Hopefully before the APM alerts you. Your primary concern is your airspeed. Speed, speed, speed. And talking about speed, in one of the incidents the crew used pitch hold and vertical speed modes during climb. You must be very careful with that. ATR procedures are very clear. In climb, you use indicated airspeed mode. Period. Comprende? However, there are two exemptions from that rule. One, when climbing above, say, flight level 150 and the rate of climb is decreasing and you are in normal atmospheric conditions, you may use pitch hold set to 5 degrees. Exactly 5 degrees pitch up. This allows you to reach your cruise level a little earlier. And two, VS mode should only be used in climb to reduce the rate of climb prior to level off in order to prevent a spurious tick as alert. That means that you reduce the rate of climb to 1000 feet per minute when you are 1000 feet below your assigned altitude. However, when you are using VS mode, vertical speed, you must monitor the airspeed very carefully. As an instructor, I'm very picky about this. Another issue, when the first crew decided to descend and turn away from severe icing conditions, they spent a lot of time talking with ATC. And in the two other cases, the pilot monitoring called ATC while the aircraft had still not recovered from the stall. Your job as a pilot monitoring is to monitor the flight and assist the pilot flying when necessary. Call out speeds, for example. Severe icing is an emergency. The procedure is clear. First, you initiate your escape maneuver. Then you inform ATC. We aviate, navigate and communicate in that order. Two of the incidents happen in a turn with about 30 degrees bank. This is logical as the angle of attack increases in turn and furthermore, the inner ailerons tends to be deflected a little down to maintain the bank. 
This will further increase the angle of attack. This is why the procedure for silver icing now requires maximum 15 degrees bank in turns, unless the speed is icing by plus 30 knots or higher. Then we have the stall recovery. In all cases, the pilot flying reacted correctly by pushing the control wheel forward. However, in two cases, the commander pulled the control wheel back. Captains, what's wrong with you? The recovery procedure from stall and roll upset is crystal clear. Push, set power MCT. If no flap, set flap 15. Only one crew set flap 15. Furthermore, the first report says that the pilot flying applied aileron opposite of the bank. This just made it worse. When a wing is stalled and the aileron is deflected down, the angle of attack increases and deepens the stall. You may use the rudder with care. And the aileron can be used once you get your speed back and the angle of attack is reduced. There were also clear indications that, in two of the incidents, the pilot flying was pulling the control wheel too early, because the stick pressure activated several times. In fact, the angle of attack was higher during the recovery than when the wing stalled. When the nose of the aircraft is pointing down, we want to pull out as soon as possible, of course. But when we have a high drag situation, the aircraft responds more slowly than we are used to when we practice stall in the simulator. And since the autopilot was engaged when the aircraft stalled, the trim was set for that speed, giving a nose-up moment when the speed increased. In all three cases, the aircraft started to climb steeply after the recovery. This resulted in loss of speed and the risk of a new stall. After the third incident, the commander decided to fly manually, which was correct. However, he also decided to maintain the flap up because the vibrations were felt in the aircraft. That was a wrong decision. The vibrations were most likely caused by uneven distribution of ice on the propellers or the spinners. It's evident that the crew in the cases we have looked at were caught by surprise. Startle and surprise effects can influence pilot performance in many ways. At the very least, these effects serve as a distraction which can disrupt normal operation and reduce your safety margins. On a more critical level, they can lead to intuitive actions and hasty decision making. Well-learned procedures and skills can be discarded and are substituted by the first thing that comes to mind. Several other incidents and accidents have happened because the crew members have reacted incorrectly following sudden and unexpected situations. This has increased the industry focus on the startle effect. In 2018, EASA published a research report named Startle Effect Management. This resulted in a new training program aimed at contracting the startle effect. If you are an instructor, you should read that report. You find the link below. However, the startle effect doesn't only apply to aviation. Let me give you an example. Some years ago, I started scuba diving. I have about 100 dives, so I'm not experienced. But the training I received was really good. And I had the opportunity to dive every week, which gave me the benefit of regularity. During one of my dives, at about 15 meters depth, my mouthpiece separated from the regulator. Surprised, I watched the regulator drifting away, thinking, that cannot happen to me. Then, after a couple of seconds, the training kicked in. I grabbed my secondary regulator and could breathe normally again. Then I signaled to my dive buddy, who remained extra close to me for the rest of the dive. This could have ended much worse, but the training prevented this from happening. This is Mark Levy, 
He's a former Boeing 747 captain with British Airways, flight instructor and display pilot. One day he was given the opportunity to fly a P-51 Mustang at an airshow at Duxford in England. While flying in formation with other P-51s at 500 feet, the engine failed. He had very little time to react, but managed to make a perfect emergency landing in a field. And this is how he describes the startle effect. Obviously the airlines over the last 30 years have spent a lot of money uh, and done a lot of research about how the human being interacts with machinery and how we as basically with the still the prehistoric model of uh, the way our brains work but we're operating modern machinery and that prehistoric model comes to the fore when you're under stress so we call it the, we call it the chimpanzee mode you're going back to something from the stone age the fight or flight mode and that's designed to put all kinds of chemicals into your bloodstream and run away from a saber-toothed tiger or a mammoth which is great if the complexity of the problem is simply turning around and running away but if you've got a complex problem in front of you that actually gets in the way you get this blind panic comes on and you want to do something you want to do something anything because that's what your prehistoric man is telling you now with these airplanes airliners military airplanes you need to have an instinct which draws you back from that take a breath the startle factor can actually make you do something dumb quickly what you want to do is can the startle factor put the chimpanzee back in the box give yourself time to think and then your more modern instincts will come to the fore and you'll start to do something sensible yeah. and what we're trained is that a good way of caging the chimp as you call it is to come up to with some one of those uh, learnt ingrained patterns which tells you to do something so if you if you have a, a scan check we do with an engine failure right okay the engines fail access that little uh, piece of data and go right so I'm gonna need to change the tanks over go put the boost pump on make sure the mixture is rich the mags are on both and that action of doing something which is ingrained in your memory will start to cage the chimp and bring you back to the kind of the modern guy which will actually work the problem in a logical fashion Below is a link to an in-flight video showing Mark's emergency landing. It's really amazing. And that's all for this time. I really hope you have learned something. Remember, follow the procedures and speed. Never forget to speed. Please support this channel by sharing with your friends, subscribe and click the notification bell. Have a wonderful day and happy landing.